warm uh, welcome to all of the subscribers of the Global Energy Association. This is the continuation of our magnificent series uh, with people who've been shortlisted for this year's prize. And today we have a guest whose name I can pronounce easily because he's a Slav, Piotr Zelenay. Although I'd imagine, Dr. Zelenay, that your, your surname must be misinterpreted as mine is many, on many occasions in America where you work now. <laughs> Yeah, my name is uh, be, 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 being often pronounced as Zeleny. We pronounce it Zelenai, but uh, actually, in the last, my last name is Hungarian. It's not even Polish. Ah, well, my problem is that, you know, everyone knows me as Mr. Brilev, Dr. Brilev, although in Russian it is, of course, pronounced like Brilev, but I'm so used to it that I don't, see, uh, I don't actually correct people. Be, be, be like uh, as they pronounce. Now, you've been nominated for pioneering contributions, I'm quoting here, to fundamental research, technology development, and commercial production of fuel cell catalysts and devices. Now, if you win and you go to that stage, the audience there, the professional one, would immediately understand what we are talking about. But, but for those people who are not scientists, who are not involved in this research, how would you explain in simple terms what are we talking about when we say catalyst in a fuel cell and why it is so important? Hmm. We can perhaps start uh, with the fuel cell itself. Okay. So uh, fuel cell is uh, a, a converter really, it gets a, co co a converter for chemical energy into electrical energy directly. So uh, without uh, uh, being um, limited by the Carnot cycle. So in other words, because of that, uh, uh, overcoming, because of overcoming that limitation, uh, fuel cells uh, can reach uh, very high um, uh, con uh, energy conversion efficiencies. So uh, the internal, uh, internal combustion uh, uh, engine can reach efficiencies at the level of 30, 40 percent, perhaps in some cases. Uh, uh, fuel cells theoretically can uh, uh, reach efficiency very close to 100 percent. So. Uh, the fuel cells are capable of converting uh, chemical energy of the fuel. Could be typically it's uh, hydrogen, but it can be uh, methanol, for example, or uh, some other fuels, which are directly electrochemically combusted uh, within the, the fuel cell uh, uh, itself, uh, generating uh, electricity. Fuels are like batteries, not an, a, an energy storage device or electricity storage device, but it's just converter. It works when the fuel is fed into it and it stops working when the fuel stops being delivered to it. That is actually a significant advantage because uh, uh, there is no need to recharge a fuel cell. It's uh, ready immediately to deliver electricity as, as, as soon as you start delivering uh, fuel to it. Now, there are two electrochemical processes occurring uh, in the fuel cell, uh, two electrodes. One is uh, called the anode, at which uh, the fuel is uh, oxidized. Thanks the for other... repeating the secondary school stuff, but it's important for our viewers, it is. <laughs> and, uh, and the other one is uh, called the cathode, at which uh, oxygen from air is reduced. So the overall uh, reaction occurring in the fuel cell is the same as a com uh, combustion of the, of the fuel uh, under regular conditions. However, with, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the, with a very high efficiency. So uh, the, 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 the biggest challenge, of course, and the ultimate uh, target is to make a uh, fuel cell as efficient as possible, which means to operate, uh, to have the two catalysts in the two electrodes, the anode and the cathode, operate or with in the max, uh, at, the, uh, at the lowest possible so-called overpotentials. So as, called, as close to thermodynamic, uh, theoretical thermodynamic op operating potentials as possible. So the, the the most important for fuel cell performance, there are some other factors which we can talk about, or we, but we don't have to, is uh, to uh, make catalysts uh, as good a, a catalyst as possible for one and the other, uh, other electrode. Uh, and that's the, where the magic starts. That's, that's where the magic, ma magic starts, yes. Uh, so, uh, 
we are talking, in my, my case at least, uh, about uh, so-called polymer electrolyte fuel cells operating at relatively low temperatures, typically around 80 degrees C. We are also talking about a hydrogen uh, oxygen or hydrogen air fuel cell, with hydrogen being the fuel. This is the most common fuel. Uh, generating the higher power densities uh, from the fuel cell or fuel cells stacked in larger systems. Uh, so hydrogen is being oxidized at the anode and the oxygen is being reduced at the cathode. As far as the anode process is concerned, hydrogen oxidation, at least in acidic fuel cells, they could be alkaline as well, uh, hydrogen oxidation is a very fast electrochemical process. Because it is so fast, uh, because of the uh, very fast kinetics, hydrogen, for, we do, do not need much catalyst to, to oxidize hydrogen. On the cathode, however, uh, we require significant amounts of catalyst because uh, uh, oxygen reduction is a very slow process under electrochemical conditions. In both cases, the reference catalysts, uh, the incumbent catalysts, if you, uh, catalysts, if you like, uh, are based on platinum or it is just platinum. Because uh, hydrogen oxidation is, as I said, a fast process, we, uh, we require minute amounts of platinum to generate current densities required. At the cathode, because the uh, oxygen reduction is slow, we need to require much more catalysts platinum base or just platinum. In the practical systems, these are uh, often platinum uh, transition metal alloys, such as platinum cobalt, for instance. You but must the, have a lot of platinum cards in your, in your pocket. Yeah, well, <laughs> right now, the, the price of platinum is, is lower than it used to be in some cases. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's around $1,000 per ounce. Uh, Troy ounce, uh, but it, uh, I think in the past uh, it was as expensive as $2,500 per Troy ounce. Let me so, ask you a very strange question. Both uh -huh. you and I are from former communist countries. I understand that you've been working in the States since uh, late 90s. So I'll ask you a question which you immediately recognize because I'm sure that you have the same experience. When and where did you get your first credit card? Uh, a visa in the states presumably actually it wasn't a visa oh the mastercard yeah. doesn't matter yeah. i'm not going to it publicize was a MasterCard. That's <laughs> yes, but you got it presumably you received it you obtained it in america in america that's correct okay my case was i received my first ever plastic in the uk uh -huh. after which you went home surely to poland as i did to russia and you enter a shop and you want to buy something and then you realize that this is still a cash economy as you will remember in the 90s yeah. very rapidly cards substituted cash but there was this period of time when you were coming from the west with the cards and people were looking at these cards realizing hell this man has got the money but he can't stand it in my shop so that i must put this little machine which reads the cards this is an egg and chicken question uh, about what comes first, a card in your pocket or this little machine in the shop which reads it. I will mm -hmm. now reinterpret this question, to, uh, having in mind hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, what will come first, a supply of hyd um, a hydrogen, um, a hydrogen car or a hydrogen petrol station? Mm -hmm. What will come first? Yes, well, what do you create first? An infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think I would, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the question often asked is, uh, what could, should come first? Should uh, that be infrastructure, that's hydrogen uh, filling station, or should that be the fuel cell itself or fuel cell car? Uh, I think they need to come together because one cannot be with, without the other. From the technology point of view, my view, my, I think that the, the fuel cell car, ultimately fuel cell system, was ready before the infrastructure. And right now we have fuel cell powered cars 
as commercial products, but their intra-market in production is limited by the lack of the in infrastructure. In many the places. reason I'm asking this question is that um, this uh, video um, session that we're having now is in between Russia and the United States. Well, the United States obviously being the richest country in the world, et cetera, et cetera, but Russia is also in the in the north of this planet, where infrastructure is being built, where people think about modern technologies. But a lot of our viewers right now are in the developing world. How viable, how conceivable are all these ideas, not just in the rich corner of the world, but also in the south? Mm, I think they are conceivable. I think the south may have certain advantage which we know from the introduction of cell phones, for instance, mm -hmm. where the lack of mm, classical or, or, or old uh, telephone infrastructure allowed the South or many Southern countries to bypass the, uh, the, the, the landline the, era. The line of yeah, the stationary, uh, stationary phone infrastructure. And I think that, uh, like in many other cases, it's a matter of Cost. If uh, if the cost is brought down to uh, to the level comparable to that of uh, uh, generating uh, the cost of hydrogen, especially uh, of generating uh, uh, petrol uh, or uh, gasoline, as we would say here in in the US, or well, you sometimes uh, even say gas, which is absolutely confusing. Uh, but anyway, right. <laughs> this is confusing. Of course, not for people who, who are used to. to, to to talking in those terms, but I think I, I think it's once the cost parity is reached, I don't uh, I don't think it's going to be a big problem because at some point you just need to make a decision which uh, uh, which, which fuel you are committing to. You occupy in this research a very interesting corner, which is very important for a lot of people in the United States, in Russia, in Northern Europe, who are involved in oil and gas exploration. Because the more these days, the more they hear about the climate change, etc., the more they are afraid, the more afraid they are uh, of a perspective on this danger on the horizon of theirs, that solar, uh, solar panels, uh, windmills, etc., will substitute the traditional thing. As far as the hydrogen is concerned, there are several ways of obtaining it, right? Uh, you can uh, do it very in a very old fashion, which I think is disappearing, coal. You can extract it from natural gas, or you could even use this very modern technologies of uh, getting it out of water, obviously, yeah. uh, using the electricity produced in, in, in turn in the alternative energy sector. There are all sorts of, 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 of these things. Well, your research is, of course, not about the industrial production, but you know how it works. Um, do you think the oil and gas industry will survive in the hydrogen era, if it ever comes? <laughs> See, I may not have enough knowledge to, to answer this question. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, that there is a danger for that particular industry uh, to become less important. Uh, but also there is obviously a benefit uh, that uh, certain areas of uh, energy generation will become less dependent. I don't know if that in industry is, uh, is going to survive. I think it, as far as the source of, uh, uh, of, che of, chemical, uh, of chemicals, of oh, this is obvious. Be. Yes. Oh, oh, this is obvious. It, it, it would survive. As a ma major supplier of, um, of fuels for cars and uh, electricity generation, etc., the importance of that in, in industry will uh, ultimately uh, will, be, will become less. So that industry needs, uh, uh, and, and in many cases has already started looking into um, becoming more uh, involved in clean, uh, so-called clean energy generation. But what about hydrogen in particular? Do you think uh, the major source of uh, industrial hydrogen will be the natural right. gas? Or right. Of course, vast major, 
hydrogen is a byproduct for many synthesis processes. Uh, so, uh, and it is effectively uh, generated from fossil fuels. There is no question about it. The interesting aspect of it is, though, that uh, even, uh, even though it is generated still from fossil fuels, uh, the use of hydrogen allows to increase so-called well-to-wheels uh, efficiency because, uh, because of the, the, the high efficiency of the, the electricity generation once you have the fuel. No. Okay, so that is, uh, that is something which is uh, often not realized, but... Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the ultimate uh, target of so-called uh, hydrogen economy is obviously to generate hydrogen from so-called clean sources, like you mentioned. And uh, that will, will, will be obviously solar, wind, or combination of the two like pursued in Germany now? Well, we'll see. We are, of course, in scientific question, but, you know, because we uh, speak a lot with the people from the industry, I feel certain solidarity. Um, so for me, uh, this is another question, of course, but for me, the question of sustainable development is about creating new technologies and making energy, of course, more affordable uh, and more accessible, but also about, if not keeping the old-fashioned jobs, then you know, uh, recreating them. So, well, you know, uh, I know the coal miners thing in Poland. Uh, I have a lot of friends in the coal industry here in Russia. Yes, the technologies have changed, believe it or not, but in the Soviet times, in the communist times, there was more than a million coal miners in the USSR. Mm -hmm. These days, in Russia only, there are 150,000, and they produce more coal than they used to do in the Soviet times. So technology mm -hmm. change. But of course, people look at uh, coal with suspicion. But people look at hydrogen with suspicion as well. You know, the first image in an educated mind, which, uh, which comes to an educated mind, is the Hindenburg, Hindenburg uh, yeah. Dirigable, as they were called back then, exploding. What do you say to that? Well, you see, the energy content of hydrogen is comparable to that of gasoline, so, or petrol, if you like, in British or European terms. Uh, so. I think that in one case we are dealing with gas, in, a, in, a, in, another, in the other case we are dealing with, uh, uh, with the liquid uh, fuel. Uh, both have a very high energy content, uh, especially gasoline actually. actually. So, um, so I think it's perhaps a different set of precautions we need to use uh, with hydrogen versus gasoline, but ultimately we just need to be careful. Uh, without uh, high energy content, the fuel is a little, offers very little value. Okay, I've deliberately made this conversation more understandable for wider audiences. But now let us imagine that we're not being listened by wider audiences and you address your fellow scientists. Uh, as imagined that in the next uh, minute or so, I, the, the only thing I, I'm, I'm going to be understanding is off about if etc. And all of the words will be from outer space. But when you meet your fellow scientists, uh, what is the main challenge in your sphere of interest? What's, what are you talking about? What's, 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 the thing that you must, what's the thing that you must overcome? Well, so I probably need to pick up where, I, uh, where we left off when we started. Yes, absolutely. So we started talking about the fuel cell uh, and uh, and the catalyst and the cost of catalysts because they are uh, platinum based. Again, we are talking about polymer electrolyzed fuel cells. There are many other types of fuel cells that we can talk and talk about too. Uh, the biggest challenge right now in general is the cost. And it's not very surprising. This is understandable. Yeah. yeah. And the other cost is durability of all those new systems. Uh, when it comes to hydrogen, uh, oxygen fuel cell, hydrogen and fuel cell for automotive transportation, which has been the main uh, focus of our research here in Los Alamos, uh, Los Alamos fuel cell program, which by the way, uh, has been around the longest in the world, I think. It started in the, uh, in the early 1970s during the first oil crisis and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, has continued ever since. Okay. So, 
uh, so the, the, the challenge is the cost because of uh, the precious metal involved in uh, generating electricity. It, it, to what degree it's a, it's a challenge. So we combine single fuel cells into fuel cell stack, containing many fuel cells to generate sufficient power in the fuel cell car, fuel cell powered car. So the, uh, the, the cost of platinum needed in the current uh, automotive fuel cell system uh, represents close to 40% of, of the fuel cell stack cost. Even at that low cost of platinum I already mentioned, with the, the, an introduction of fuel cell cars into the market, the, the, uh, the demand is going to drive the cost of platinum up. Increase in the volume is not going to help in this case because a, the precious metal market is not subject to, to the economies of scale. No, this is good news for Russia, which is a major platinum producer. So yeah. go on. So, so what we need to do is to reduce the amount. And we've, we as a community uh, have been uh, doing that for years now by reducing the amount of platinum. That turned out to be very successful. Uh, to, the, the, to the point that now you can buy in certain parts of the world uh, with uh, hydrogen, some kind of hydrogen uh, infrastructure in place, you can buy fuel cell cars. There are three uh, passenger cars available in the market, so the, uh, made by Toyota first, then Honda and uh, Hyundai now. Now, uh, so one approach is to reduce uh, the amount of platinum, that amount of platinum has been reduced through different means. The other way is, of course, to re re replace platinum altogether with non-platinum uh, catalysts, especially at the cathode we already talked about. And this is what I am doing. Uh, we've been doing, and other people in the field uh, have been doing, developing so-called non-platinum group metal catalysts or platinum group metal free catalysts. Like what? Uh, so, in our case, this has been uh, carbon-based catalysts. These are these are catalysts which are typically based on high surface area area carbon, uh, doped with nitrogen, uh, and uh, transition metals in relatively slow uh, low quantities. But these uh, these are transition non-precious metals, obviously. And most commonly it's iron, but it could be cobalt, manganese in some cases. In these metals, uh, uh, active sites are created, supposedly involving the transition metal, coordinated by nitrogen, which uh, uh, show sig significant activity in oxygen reduction reaction. So this is the reaction which in, in the fuel cell is taking place at the cathode. And requires uh, uh, large quantities of platinum, which drive up the cost of the fuel cell stack. Well, all I can say at this stage is that uh, 15 scientists from all over the world, Australia, Denmark, the United States, China, etc., uh, have been selected by our technical experts for the short list, which will be looked at by the International Committee on the 8th, uh, on the 7th of uh, September, and then announced on the uh, announced will be on the eighth uh, the names of the of the winners, and all I can say at this stage that it's going to be a tough decision for the international committee because the, the more I speak to our nominees, the more impressed I am. Uh, well, congratulations on your research, Peter, uh, and uh, please please stay on our orbit. Uh, I wish luck to all of the nominees. Of course, we'll see what the international committee decides, but uh, let's keep in touch. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.